So let us continue. Uh, today we will discuss uh, a topic that is um, a kind of extension of the topic that we discussed previously about principal component analysis. Uh, but uh, principal component analysis uh, works with uh, numeric data. So if you have several uh, numeric variables, uh, it can uh, decrease uh, the dimensionality of your space, decrease the number of variables. Uh, and um, so we can do some visualizations and, uh, and so on. Uh, but uh, what if uh, we have not, uh, not uh, numeric variables, but some categorical variables, uh, which is uh, rather often uh, in uh, linguistical applications. Uh, there are some uh, methods uh, that uh, allows us to uh, do something uh, that is similar to principal component analysis, actually. Um, actually, we will use uh, uh, an, algorithms, uh, an algorithm from principal component analysis uh, to this kind of data, uh, but uh, we have to uh, do it uh, in a rather different way. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this thing is called a correspondence analysis. Uh, and uh, today we will discuss um, how, how this correspondence analysis works. Uh, honestly, uh, when, uh, when I first tried to understand uh, what correspondence analysis do, uh, I, um, it was very difficult for me. Um, I think that now uh, I understand it better, but anyway, um, it is much more uh, difficult to interpret uh, pictures that are obtained from correspondence analysis than uh, from just simple principal component analysis, uh, just because of different nature of data. But I hope that um, that uh, I will give you some ideas uh, that uh, uh, will allow you to interpret uh, these things correctly. So. Uh, let us uh, begin uh, with uh, some examples. Let us assume that we have some data set uh, with two different categorical variables. Uh, so uh, if we have just two uh, numeric variables, uh, then uh, actually, usually problem solved already, because if you have just two numeric variables, then you, you can uh, just make a, a scatter plot and see all the relations between these variables uh, that you, you want to. Uh, but uh, if you have two uh, categorical variables uh, and each variable have several levels, uh, then uh, things uh, become more complicated. Uh, I will uh, use the following example. Uh, this is not a linguistic example, but uh, I think that this is an example that is easy to follow. Uh, let us assume that we have uh, we have some information about uh, some survey, and uh, in this uh, survey, people um, estimate uh, their health status. Uh, and let us assume that we have uh, two categorical variables. Uh, in our example, uh, these uh, categorical, uh, these uh, variables are uh, like age category. Actually, of course, we can measure age uh, as a numeric variable, but um, assume that uh, due to some reasons, uh, we have uh, age as the categorical variable. In this case, it is ordered categorical variable, but uh, we will not use uh, this now. Let us assume that we have, uh, for example, four uh, categories for age or five. Uh, for example, uh, child, uh, child, young adult, 
Okay, child, teenager, young adult. Um, senior, okay, major and senior. Uh, something like this. And uh, let us assume that we have uh, another variable, which is uh, like uh, health, um, like, how this particular person um, uh, estimate their their own health. Uh, it can be, for example, we will use three categories, uh, like good, um, bad, and something in the middle. Um, medium. Medium, okay. Medium. medium is a kind of, it's like, well, okay, medium. Uh, not good, uh, how it was, not good, not terrible. Uh, okay, and uh, then we have information uh, about each uh, participant of our study. Uh, so we have uh, a very long table uh, when we have informant ID, uh, and then we have age category and health category. And we have something like and health is good and uh, another informant senior and uh, health is also good. And there is some young adult. Uh, sorry, not here. Um, oh, with health bad and so on. So we have this table. And uh, let me assume that uh, I want to visualize uh, this data e e in some way. I, I want to draw uh, some picture, or for example, two-dimensional picture or even one-dimensional picture. Uh, probably I don't know, uh, I don't know the relation between uh, these age categories and uh, I don't know the relation between this uh, health status. So uh, in advance, I don't know that uh, there is an order uh, on these categories. I just forget about it. And I, 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 want, to, uh, I want to reconstruct it uh, from my data. Uh, so uh, what, uh, what can we do with, with this data? Are there any ideas how to simplify this data? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, let me see. Okay, just a second.
Okay, so uh, so I think we can continue. Uh, so uh, we have this uh, we have this data as on the screen. Uh, for each informant, we have age and uh, health status, uh, and uh, we want to visualize this data in some way. Uh, how can we do it? Uh, uh, can you suggest uh, the first step? Uh, what what can we do with with this table? Just to understand the relationship between uh, these two variables, these two categorical variables. Are there any ideas? Anybody can suggest something? We should maybe compare uh, variables from the column of uh, age category and uh, variables from column with health uh, status, uh, which are more likely to uh, be uh, found together. Yes, yes, we are interested in, in uh, some well, it is not a correlation, but uh, uh, we are interested uh, in how often which categories uh, uh, appear with with which category. So, uh, which levels which levels uh, appear with which levels. So, how to do it numerically? We have to proceed uh, from this table to to what table? So, we can just transform. We discussed that already. Uh, how to transform categorical data to something more feasible. Any ideas? Any? Probably you remember when we discussed two categorical two categorical variables uh, previously we discussed his squared test and which transformation we discussed uh, there which table we used to uh, to do this his squared test yeah Contingency table, Alexei is right. Uh, so uh, we want to transform it to contingency table. And uh, this will be something like this. Uh, we have we have the following table. So we have three columns. Uh, in the uh, we have a column that uh, corresponds to health. Uh, goat, medium, bad, uh, and okay, a little bit. I need a little bit more space. Let me shift everything to the right. I will miss these possibilities when we return to just an ordinary uh, whiteboards. Okay, uh, so we have H, here H, and here health. And we have categories child, teenager, Young adult, major, senior. 
Uh, and then we have some some numbers here, uh, like 35, uh, 20, 20, 40, 20, 10, five hundred, five one. 20, 20, 20, 20, 30. So, uh, something like this. Uh, these numbers are just counts. Uh, so uh, this, uh, for example, uh, this value just means that we have in our table, we have uh, 35 in our original table. Uh, we have 35 uh, roles, 35 informants uh, who are child uh, with good health. Okay. Uh, now, um, what I want to do is uh, to, 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 to visualize this data in some way. Uh, basically, we can think about uh, this table as like uh, we just have three numeric variables. Uh, but uh, it is not a very good approach here uh, because actually our our variables, our columns, are not just uh, just a kind of numeric variable as we uh, as we think about them. Um, they represent uh, some relations uh, between two categorical variable. And so we have to transform our table uh, once more uh, to take into account some property of, uh, of these values. Um, uh, one problem uh, is uh, the following. Uh, let us assume that uh, we have uh, two rows uh, that uh, look like the following. Um, uh, how to compare, uh, for example, rows. Let us assume that we have two rows uh, and uh, these rows are the following. We have 10, 20, 30, 40, and uh, for example, 50, 100, 2000. No, 200. Uh, assume that uh, I have these two rows. Uh, each, rows uh, each row corresponds to one level uh, of uh, this, uh, of this uh, categorical variable. And assume that uh, I have two rows, just uh, these two rows uh, does not belong to this uh, table with these numbers, but let us assume that in some other experiment, uh, we have two rows like this one. Uh, what can we say uh, about uh, the relation of uh, the corresponding levels uh, of uh, this category uh, with uh, this category? Uh, can we say that uh, these levels are different in relation to this category or not? No, we cannot because uh, even despite the fact that there are different uh, number of uh, people in each category, or the соотношение. Um, yeah, per uh, percentage. The percentage is uh, the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You see that uh, if, uh, if, for example, we see that uh, this, uh, this corresponds to, for example, teen, and this corresponds to young, probably, uh, if, if we have this data, uh, we see that uh, uh, if we think about uh, health of these two categories, 
uh, their distribution, uh, distribution of their health status uh, is the same. Just because, uh, just because in both of uh, these rows, we have the same, the same proportion, the same percentages uh, of uh, these, these numbers. We just have more uh, young adults in our, uh, in our data uh, than teenagers uh, due to some, I don't know, uh, some uh, um, properties of our experiment. Uh, but uh, when we think about uh, relation between, uh, about interpretation of these numbers uh, in terms of relation uh, of this variable and this variable, we see that they are identical. Uh, so we have to take into account uh, this fact. And uh, to do so, we can uh, transform our data once more and uh, we can uh, move uh, from, uh, from uh, these numbers to the corresponding percentages. Uh, if we do it, uh, we just uh, get uh, the same the same rows. So if we uh, transform to percentages, uh, then uh, we have something like this. Okay, uh, ten, um, so the overall sum here uh, is 70 here. Uh, and uh, 350 here. Uh, so if I transform it to percentages, uh, I will get, okay, I will get not very nice uh, numbers, but uh, let me just use them. Okay, all dot 14. One dot 28 and all dot Fifty-seven. Okay, I have to. Uh, I have to use a bit different way to to round this. Um, this these numbers. Uh, so, uh, if I if I transform to percentages, I mean that I just divide all these numbers by this number, and all these numbers by this number. Uh, then uh, I will get uh, the same the same values for both rows. So this is team, this is young. Uh, but uh, e even uh, after, after this transformation, uh, I want to uh, save uh, somehow information uh, about the difference uh, in uh, the group sizes. Uh, so uh, I will attach to each row, I will attach, uh, I will attach a mass. Mass uh, is just proportional to these numbers. So, uh, so we have some some column column with masses. Uh, mass proportional to number of uh, items in each row. So now after we do this transformation, uh, we have a, a new table and uh, this table can look uh, like the following. I do not, uh, uh, I, I don't want to, uh, 
I don't want to say that my new table uh, exactly is created from this table because uh, I don't want to do a lot of arithmetic here. Uh, I just put uh, some new more or less random numbers. Uh, so transform table. Uh, is the following. It is like, again, we have three uh, columns and we have five rows uh, and we have additional row mass. And now this is health and this is Uh, H and we have So we have this new table uh, and in this table we have some numbers uh, like Something like this, and we have some messes here, uh, like I want everything to sum up to one uh, here. So this is no, this is too many. Okay, uh, so uh, this, uh, this is my transform data. Uh, now that uh, this new table uh, more or less uh, have the same information as the original table uh, up to some scaling of all numbers. If I multiply all numbers by uh, some uh, fixed value, then this table will not change. And in the column with mass, it is uh, the amount of uh, the age groups, yes? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. It is percentage, so uh, we just, um, uh, we see that uh, the sum of this value is one, and uh, each value here is just proportional to the number of people of uh, a particular age group in our sample, yes. So, uh, are there any question uh, about this table? How this table uh, uh, was obtained from the original original data? Okay, so everything is clear, right? Just ask me if anything is not clear. 
I think it's clear till now. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So uh, let us continue now. Uh, I want to visualize uh, the data in this table. I do not uh, try to do uh, to do dimensionality reduction now. I just want to visualize uh, the data in this table in the some kind of natural space uh, where it can be visualized. So uh, now uh, I need your three-dimensional uh, imagination uh, because uh, we have uh, basically if we think about this part of the table uh, we have three columns. We have also this mass column, but uh, it is not important for now. I'm just interested uh, in these uh, three columns. Uh, and uh, to, uh, and uh, I want to introduce uh, the following thing. Um, you know that you can uh, you can create uh, like we like we created two-dimensional uh, Cartesian plane to show uh, the relation between two variables. We can also use three-dimensional Cartesian uh, space uh, to show uh, to to plot uh, uh, points uh, where each point corresponds to a triple of numbers. So to show the relation between three variables. So now we can uh, consider these uh, three columns just as uh, three numeric variables uh, and uh, plot uh, the following the following graph. Okay, let me use this coordinate system. Um, let this be good. This is medium, and this is bad. And uh, then each point uh, from uh, each row of this table uh, corresponds to one point uh, in this three dimensional space. So uh, I can put values one, one, one here. And uh, then I can uh, consider some point like this point. And I assume that uh, for this point I have, okay, let me try to, to draw for example, this child uh child point uh that corresponds to here value o dot four here value o dot three and here value okay i have to move it uh, a little bit lower Here is O dot three. This point. So uh, the distance between this point and uh, this plane uh, is uh, this O dot three, and it corresponds to this number. Uh, the distance of this point uh, from, for example, this plane uh, is this uh, O dot four, this this value, and it corresponds to this number. So, uh, if we specify three numbers, we spe we specify this point in this three-dimensional space. Usually, when I uh, explain it uh, in uh, in uh, the physical room. Uh, I just uh, run in uh, auditorium and uh, I show that uh, there is a point and there is a distance from uh, from the floor, from the wall, and from another wall, and then uh, everything is more or less clear. But now I don't have uh, uh, an ability to to do it, so. I, 
I have to, to uh, use your imagination instead. Okay, so uh, everybody are comfortable with this three-dimensional uh, coordinate system? I think yes. Mm -hmm. Any other opinions? Uh, are there any questions? Okay, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I can ask you a question. Um, you see that uh, in this table, uh, these uh, values are not uh, independent. I mean that uh, in each row, by definition, uh, we have uh, the following condition satisfied. The sum of these values equals to one. The, j just because uh, these values are just the proportions and so they have to sum up to, to one. So, uh, I, uh, I have to uh, ask you the following question. Uh, how the set of all possible uh, points here that corresponds to all possible values in these rows uh, looks like? So, um, can we draw this set? This is actually not a, a very simple, uh, uh, this is not a very simple question because you have to, to have some three-dimensional imagination to do it. Um, uh, may I, may I yes? try? Um, yes, sure. Probably uh, it's connected like um, yeah, the volume of the cube uh, that can be built by these um, uh, points of every, um, uh, variable of uh, each category, so the whole value, uh, the, the the whole volume of the um, um, of the cube is one. Like, uh, if we, um, it's so difficult to say it in in English. Можно по русски. Если мы соединим точки, которые у нас единица, у нас получится куб объемом один. Мы будем брать э, точки, которые относятся к каждому, э, каждой категории возраста, э, вот как, например, э, мы начертили для первой категории, для child. Mm -hmm. э, у нас пропорционально это 0,1. То есть это должно быть 0,1 от объема большого куба. Не очень понятно, откуда взялось число 0,1. Вот оно из массы. А, а, а вот, за счет массы. Нет, э, игнорируйте массу. Massa меня сейчас не интересует. Я массу вот сейчас... I do not try to represent this variable mass uh, in this picture yet. Uh, I, we, just, we just think about only, only, this, uh, only these variables. Можно предположить пару Давайте. Mm -hmm. uh, возможно, это... Будет диагональное сечение куба, то есть если у нас по Z это будет единица, то получается, да, 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 вот про такую mm -hmm. штуку я как бы говорю, yes. если mm -hmm. по Z у нас это будет единица, то получается по остальным это должно быть ноль. И как бы получается с, с остальными также, поэтому как бы куб должен быть по, по диагонали рассечен. Mm -hmm. uh, да, спасибо, Антон. Uh, yes, uh, Антон said uh, the correct uh, the correct point, the correct thing uh, that we have to consider a plane uh, that pass uh, through these uh, three points. This is a kind of diagonal of a cube, diagonal plane. Uh, because, for example, if we uh, um, okay, uh, let us just think uh, about uh, this point. If we know that uh, the value of one category is uh, equals to just one, then it means that uh, the corresponding value for other two categories have to be zero, uh, just because their sum have to be one. Uh, so we can put uh, these three points immediately. And uh, we see that these three points belong to our space. And uh, actually, it um, it is some exercise uh, in uh, some I don't know how to say it linear algebra uh, probably uh, to to show that um, our relation actually our relation is like 
x plus y plus z equals to one. Uh, this relation uh, defines uh, some plane. So uh, this is just like x plus y equals to one defines uh, in two dimensional uh, in two dimensional uh, defines line straight line. Uh, we considered this thing previously, something like this. And uh, in the same way, in three-dimensional space, uh, this relation uh, defines uh, some uh, triangle. This triangle, uh, uh, actually, a plane, uh, a plane that uh, contains these three points and this triangle. Uh, and our values here, they are just a proportion, so they are all positive. So out of this, uh, out of this triangle, uh, we have. Uh, we have uh, out of this plane, we just have this triangle because uh, we, we, we have to consider an intersection of this plane uh, with uh, this part of the space when all coordinates are positive. So uh, all our points uh, live on this triangle. Okay. Uh, now, uh, when I know that all these points lie uh, on this triangle, uh, I can actually draw the corresponding picture in dimension two because uh, we have uh, we have this. We have this plane, and plane is two-dimensional, and I can draw this picture. Uh, let me do it. So I will have uh, the following. I will have uh, three points, and each point corresponds to a level of one of our uh, of our this is medium this is good and this is bad uh, so we have three uh, three uh, value, uh, three levels of our health category and uh, then we have uh, just uh, three points here and we have a triangle Uh, and uh, all points lie inside of this triangle, like this. So uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, uh, five elements here, so we have five points. Okay, this is not a five, but six, something like this. Um, and um, the how to interpret these points on this picture. In fact, uh, let us consider this point. Uh, this point uh, is close to this uh, bed uh, and uh, it is equally distant from this medium and good. It means uh, that uh, in the corresponding row, we have large value that corresponds to bed and uh, much smaller values that corresponds to medium and good. So uh, this point uh, is probably something like uh, okay. Uh, this point uh, is probably something like o dot eight, o dot one, o dot one. And so, uh, for example, uh, what can you say about, say, um, let me use this point. 
assume that this point is somewhere here. What can you say uh, about uh, coordinates of this point? You can just write uh, your suggestions uh, to private messages. So uh, let us fix uh, order in some way. Okay, the order was good, medium, bad. Uh, so uh, I have to uh, I have to change order here. So if we have order good, medium, bad, uh, then uh, we have to swap. Uh, we have to swap these two values. So uh, for this order, good medium bad which numbers approximately we have to to, to put here uh okay uh all dot three all dot three all dot four uh, i'm not sure about um now look uh the the more uh, distance from the point to the corresponding point here, the less uh, the corresponding value. Uh, for example, if, uh, if we have, uh, let us look at this triangle. Uh, this this point uh, corresponds to some point that is far from this bed and uh, close to this, this segment. So this point, uh, in fact, this point uh, corresponds to some point here. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, this is uh, this is more plausible uh, answer. Uh, this is uh, this is something like o dot uh, forty five o dot forty five o dot one something like this. Because, uh, because this distance is large, then the corresponding value is small. Okay. Uh, for example, if, uh, if we have some point, for example, here, uh, it means uh, which, which coordinates uh, this point have. Uh, What is the coordinates of this point? This point. Mm -hmm. uh, zero, uh, zero, one, zero, exactly, yeah. Because uh, here we see that medium is the closest point and the distance uh, from these two points uh, is large. Exactly. So uh, this uh, this is actually called uh, barycentric coordinates. But you don't have to remember this notation. Just this is just a trivia. Okay. Uh, now uh, let us uh, let us uh, try to imagine uh, how our original data looks like on this picture. Um, again, let me. Draw this triangle. So we have this bed. Good and medium. Okay, so um, uh, let us think about uh, our original data, probably about this table. Uh, what can uh, we say about uh, these combinations of numbers uh, like presented here? Uh, 
and we can try to, to just to use some common sense here uh, which combinations are uh, probably not uh, which combinations we do not expect in this in this table in this kind of table just we can use here some common sense we, we understand now the meaning of this uh, of this variables of these variables of these variables which combination uh, is uh, will be rather surprising for us if we uh, if we meet it in our data the combination of variables in a row that would be more or less than one in sum uh, we by definition, the sum of all values uh, in a row is equal to one. So uh, this is not uh, this is not what I'm asking. We assume that uh, okay. Mm. We can interpret uh, we can interpret this data in some way. Uh, we see from this data that uh, teenagers and young people. Uh, um, Teen or young plus medium or bad. Uh, yes, probably. But uh, let us uh, let us now think only about uh, possible rows. Which rows uh, seem to be more or less impossible uh, without relation to the particular value of this variable. I just want you to to provide some kind of impossible row that satisfies the condition that the sum of all values equals to one but uh, that uh, doesn't make sense from just common sense point of view. Mm. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, yes, this, uh, this is, uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm asking now uh, you to forget about these values and think only uh, about uh, impossible row here. So just which row uh, seem to be impossible for any of these levels? Just zero, zero, 001. No, I think zero, zero, 001 is pretty, pretty, uh, uh, pretty possible uh, combination of values. It is just um, probably some uh, old people who, who just feel their self bad. Um, probably not not exactly zero zero one, but some something close. Um, Lisa, I'm not sure I get your idea. Actually, my idea is is pretty simple. Uh, I just say that uh, we understand that uh, it is possible that in some uh, age groups we have uh, people who feel themselves more or less good, and in in some in some of them uh, we have people who feel themselves more or less bad, and we understand uh, which combination of numbers uh, we can expect there. But uh, what is um, rather unexpected is to see something like this. Okay, just just a last chance you to to, to answer. Just another suggestion. Um, medium that is larger than O dot three. Um, yes. Uh, uh, probably something like uh, something like this, uh, something like no medium uh, medium is larger than O three is 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 also possible, but uh, I, I think about a, a, an opposite an opposite case. Assume that uh, assume that we have, for example, O dot one in medium, and O dot uh, 85 here and O dot 85 here. Oh, I'm sorry. 45. 
something like this. This is pretty strange because it means that there is an age group uh, for which uh, people uh, have either good health or bad health, but there are no people who have medium health. This is not what, what we what we reasonably expect to see in, in our data. We, we can assume, uh, using common sense, we can assume that uh, it is possible that we have some good and medium and uh, less uh, uh, bad state or an opposite uh, case, or we have some uh, age groups uh, when we have medium large, but uh, good and bad uh, small, uh, but uh, it is pretty impossible to expect this kind of relation, right? Uh, do you agree with me with my, is my common sense uh, common enough? Okay. Let's check. Why? Uh, Irina, can you uh, can you explain further? Uh, excuse me, I yes. understand your doubt, but uh, is it really such a rare thing uh, in statistics uh, to meet when we have? Uh, for example, the same experiment, and when we have the age group where uh, some people have uh, uh, bad health, some of them are good health, and uh, there are no medium. No, I don't. I don't mean just no, but uh, a little percentage of them. Uh, okay. Yes, it is possible. It is possible that some people will be radical uh, and it is possible that in some group in some age group there will be more this kind of radical people but anyway um okay yes uh okay uh it is it is possible uh, it is possible that we we get this kind of data okay um we can uh, okay let us uh let us um decrease the level of subjectivity in this research and let us assume that uh, this category uh, this category of health status is assigned not by self-reporting but by some objective properties uh, then um, probably we don't we don't have this kind of stuff well uh, i don't mean uh, about normal distribution but i just I just use some kind of common sense. If we, if we assume that uh, in some uh, age groups uh, people are uh, mostly healthy, like uh, like young adults, young adults are mostly healthy, just because uh, they are young, and uh, seniors uh, are usually not very healthy, just because just because uh, of their age. So uh, we can uh, expect that if we have uh, a lot uh, of people with um, well, uh, uh, I think that it, it just doesn't uh, it just doesn't uh, make sense. Uh, if if we have this kind of group, uh, then well, how can we explain it? If 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 these numbers are the results of some kind of objective objective control, how can we explain how can we explain these numbers? Well, there should be some age group uh, in which we have a lot of very healthy people and a lot of uh, people with bad health and no people with medium health. Okay. Uh, even, even if you can uh, think about counterexamples, uh, just uh, let us agree that uh, my reasoning uh, makes some sense. I cannot say that... Um, I cannot say that uh, that we absolutely uh, that it is absolutely impossible to meet with uh, this kind of data. But uh, from common sense point point of view, we have we have some relation between these category levels uh, that make this more or less not expectable. Okay. 
Uh, then uh, let us return to this uh, to this triangle, and uh, let us discuss uh, what does it mean uh, that we don't have. Uh, don't have uh, data like don't have rows uh, like so this is good medium bad uh, like Uh, what does it mean from uh, the point of view of these triangles? It means that uh, the point shouldn't be very far from the medium and uh, at the same time somewhere between bad and good. Mm, yes, uh, so we actually, we can actually expect that uh, there is um, we can expect some numbers uh, here. Uh, we can expect some numbers uh, here, which are close to medium and far from bad and good. And we expect some numbers uh, here, but we do not expect uh, numbers like, let me move some points here. Uh, we do not expect when we have small medium, so we are far from medium uh, and far from bad and good. And mm, sorry, I think that so uh, let me just put uh, this point here in this in this case, oh, sorry, we have, yes, we don't expect, uh, we don't expect uh, points to be somewhere here. Um, actually, it is possible to imagine that our points like uh, something, something like this. Uh, so it is possible that uh, we have some, some kind of, of, of this data uh, that uh, varies uh, from uh, those who feel uh, their self bad and some of them medium uh, to those who feel uh, themselves good and sometimes medium. Uh, probably it is even more this, something like this. Okay, uh, I have to, to use five points. And uh, in this case, uh, we can uh, try to reduce the dimension of our space. So instead of using two dimensional space, uh, we can uh, use just one dimensional space like this straight line. And we can project everything to, the, to this straight line. Something like this. So this straight line uh, will represent uh, a kind of um, severity of conditions, the overall level of health. Uh, and uh, if we just project our data uh, onto this line, then we will get something like we will get here. Okay, very close, uh, for example, here young and here teenagers and here uh, one, two, three, four, five and 
here, for example, children, because they uh, they have their child uh, illnesses, and here we have seniors, and here major. This is uh, this is our line after projection. So we reduced the dimension from dimension two to dimension one. Uh, we can choose this line. Uh, more or less like we did it with, uh, like in principal component analysis. So again, we choose a straight line such that, uh, such that uh, all points are aligned along this line. Such that when we project our points to this line, we lose not so many information. Okay. Uh, note uh, that uh, it is also possible to put these points to the same line. Uh, so uh, we will get uh, some point here. If this is bad, uh, we will get some point here. This is medium, and we will get some point here, uh, which is good. Uh, so we Don't see we that. Don't need to change bad and good. Good. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. You are correct. Uh, so my picture. Uh, okay. Uh, let me just. Um, Let me redraw all these labels. Otherwise, uh, it doesn't uh, correspond to what uh, I said before. So here, there will be two points here. No, uh, two points here, like senior and child. Uh, we have some point here nature and we have some point here like teenagers and young adults something like this uh, so uh, in a sense we see uh, from this picture how our two categorical values are associate, uh, associated with uh, each another so we have some uh, some relation between these variables, uh, and we see we see how they are associated. Uh, so uh, this is uh, the case when we project everything to just uh, just a one line, one dimensional, one dimensional space. Uh, on practice, uh, we usually don't need this one dimensional space, but we use uh, more than one dimensional space. We can assume that we have not uh, not just two. Uh, no, no, not just uh, three categories here. For example, we can assume that in our data we have uh, like five categories for health. And in this case, uh, the whole space like here will be five dimensional. And it is impossible to imagine five, uh, five dimensional space. You can, uh, it, is, it is just, just don't, don't try to do it. Uh, and uh, this space will be four-dimensional, and again, it is impossible to imagine four-dimensional space. And um, then, uh, but again, we can uh, reduce the dimensionality, so we can we can think that we are in this four-dimensional space, and we consider some plane in this uh, four-dimensional space, such that all points lie on this, for example, two-dimensional space, more or less with some with some precision and then we will project everything to this uh, two-dimensional space so uh, we can uh, if 
for example, health category. Uh, has five levels. Uh, we can consider uh, some two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional plane. in the corresponding five-dimensional uh, five-dimensional space. And uh, then it is possible to draw, uh, okay, uh, okay uh, again we will have a first principal component and second principal component and uh, it is possible to draw some points here. These points correspond to raw uh, rows of our uh, table and uh, it is also possible to place uh, somewhere here uh, to place the corresponding uh, columns. For example, uh, it will be five points here. One, two, three, four, five. like very good good medium bad very bad uh, and uh, these points uh, these points are age groups uh, like this is uh, like senior, and this is like young. So uh, you will get a picture like this. After after this dimensionality reduction, after after the process that you find this plane in this space. And uh, it is important that each point here uh, just represents uh, the, uh, for example, these points uh, just uh, represent, uh, represent uh, these rows of our table uh, after all normalizations. So for example, if we have two points that are close to each other, then it means that, uh, that uh, they are proportional the, the, the distribution uh, with respect to the other variable of these two uh, rows is more or less the same. And we also can, uh, we also can show masses here, uh, just for example, using more large points to, to denote categories with larger mass. And uh, actually this mass uh, is used uh, when you find uh, this plane. Uh, actually you find uh, a, specific, a specific distance uh, that takes into account this mass. Well, mm, uh, there are some uh, caveats uh, in interpretation of this picture. Uh, this, is, this is not very, this is, some uh, not very simple things in the interpretation. Uh, one thing is uh, the following: the origin of this uh, of this uh, plane uh, corresponds to average distribution. So, if we see that uh, some point. Uh, is far from this origin, then it means that the distribution of uh, the corresponding, uh, the corresponding in this case age group, uh, is far from uh, the distribution of the population uh, as the whole. Uh, so the the more distance uh, between uh, this point and the center, uh, the the more difference of distribution. And uh, we can also say that if we have two 
for example, if we have, if we draw this uh, arrow uh, and this arrow, and if we see that uh, they are more or less in the same direction, uh, then it means that uh, the corresponding values, uh, the corresponding the corresponding category levels, like uh, assume that this is teenager. Um, if we see if we see a picture like this, we see that this uh, teenager's health uh, is positively associated with good status uh, and uh, good and very good status. Uh, and we see it from the fact that uh, these points lie more or less on the same line. And if they are on opposite, uh, on the, in the opposite direction, uh, for example, uh, these uh, teenagers and this very bad health status, we see that uh, they are, uh, in a sense, uh, negatively associated. Uh, that if we see people with uh, this age group, then uh, we will more more likely do not see this this uh, health status. So we can use these uh, directions, uh, the relation between these directions, to uh, understand th something about the relation between these two, uh, between uh, the corresponding uh, the corresponding uh, variables. So this is uh, this is basically how um, it works. Uh, also, uh, I have to say that if uh, the distance from our point to the origin is uh, very small, then it means that uh, this point is very close to just an average. So, for example, if we have some age group uh, which lies here, then it means that this that the distribution of people according to their health status in this uh, age group is uh, more or less the same as in the population on average. And it means that uh, it doesn't give you much information about some associations uh, between uh, this, uh, this uh, age category and uh, this health, health categories. So you can interpret uh, this picture when uh, when when you have large distance from these points to the origin. Okay, uh, I hope uh, it probably can uh, be more understandable when uh, you will look at some real data and uh, try to interpret the corresponding picture for real data. But uh, I hope that uh, I gave you some general ideas about how this method works. Are there any questions so far? I think that this picture should be interpretable and understandable. Um, are there any questions about this picture, first of all? Okay, there is a silence, so probably, um, Probably it is more or less understandable, but I'm not sure. It's more or less understandable, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Probably we can consider a categorical variable like uh, how, how much did you understand uh, all, all, all this thing, and probably uh, probably uh, we can do some. Uh, uh, correspondence analysis uh, for this data. <laughs> um, also, it is possible to consider several uh, several variables, uh, several categorical variables. Pre now we consider it only two categorical variables. Uh, it is possible to consider several categorical variables. Uh, to do it, we can just do something like 
uh, something like uh, one hot encoding or dumb encoding when we uh, in a row we uh, for example we have health status and some social economical status and uh, we can just encode uh, health status for example we have uh, health like uh, bad medium good and we have a socioeconomic status again like bad medium good and uh, then uh, for each uh, informant we can uh, just put some zeros and ones here and we can consider a new table like this and uh, then we can uh, apply the same uh, CA to this table and uh, then we get uh, multi multiple correspondence analysis but that's all that I know about this MCA algorithm that this is just an application of CA to this kind of table. So uh, I think I have to stop now and after 10 minutes break, we will continue with some practice. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So.
Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Hello, yes. Yeah, great. Okay. So we today we will uh, mostly do the uh, correspondence analysis and multiple correspondence analysis um, uh, uh, techniques. But actually, uh, while all these techniques uh, can be reduced to just two functions, uh, the first one usually do the correspondence analysis, uh, some analysis, right? And the second one just plot what we want to do, to do. So actually today we will focus on the new linguistic data and ways to interpret what we see on our correspondence analysis plots. Great. Uh, so um, first of all, let me start with the first uh, case study. Um, and um, as we um, come to the linguistic data, I took um, uh, the article of my colleagues and me from 2017. Uh, in which we uh, asked ourselves whether the aspect of individual verbs in Russian can be predicted based on some statistical distribution on uh, their uh, features, grammatical features. So uh, mainly about, uh, well, the distribution of, of their inflectional forms. The idea was that actually uh, the native speakers of Russian uh, can usually uh, say uh, what aspect is for the verb like for verb like uh, читать imperfective or for uh, the verb прочитать perfective yeah so actually it is a linguistic category but usually uh, native speakers can easily do some naive linguistic analysis and usually children of 10 years are already ready to do the, which, uh, this analysis. But actually this um, uh, question is not that easy for foreigners if they learn Russian as a foreign language. But at some level they also start to use imperfectives and perfectives correctly yeah so we assume that uh, if a person have certain input of some forms of these or that verbs they actually uh, acquire this grammatical category so our idea was that we can just use uh, these um, grammatical features as predictors and try to well um, see whether the distribution of uh, inflect of imperfective and perfective forms is uh, okay so um let us look at this data so i will just ask you to uh, download this rmd um, file and you can just start do some coding okay here i just well um read the data and well we can see the structure of this data frame so what we did actually we took uh, a large sample from the russian national corpus and for each use of the verb we coded the use of each uh, grammatical category such as Dance or transitivity or person or number or gender or and so, so on and so forth. So here you can see uh, some uh, well levels uh, of about ten uh, factors. And first, I will do some pre-processing, just as we did uh, in our study. So first I need uh, to, well, do some less detailed picture of my data. 
And first of all, we saw that there is a number of future passives and we just want to join them with uh, other passive participles just to well make all participles one category i mean this kind of uh, category and then we can see a top uh, 10 of verbs in our data set so here i just use uh, the uh, ordinary group by and summarize functions to show the most frequent verbs in my data set. So here you can see that which is the most uh, most frequent verb and then much, start, говорить, сказать, and so on and so forth. Uh, so for Gadir, I just say that these are different lexemes of Russian verbs. And today we are not interested in its semantic, just in some uh, aspectual use. Okay, then we, uh, for each verb, we constructed uh, a grammatical profile. So actually grammatical profile is a vector that contains the number or rather the ratio of inflectional forms for each lima, yeah? Uh, for example, if I take the verb uh, читать, I know that in my corpus sample it has um, two uses of um, gerund, present gerund. Well, I think that non-past is just a present form of gerund. And then eight forms of imperatives and one form of indicative future and 15 forms of indicative present forms or indica uh, and 14 forms of past forms and 22 infinities. Yeah, so this is just, well, uh, a re representation of the grammatical profile of any verb. Uh, Another way to do grammatical profiling is to present the same data as proportions. Yeah, so in this line, I just uh, do some proportions and we can see that, well, could you tell me which form is most used for the verb читать? the infinitive uh right yeah we have uh, 35 percent infinitives well and then uh present forms are on the uh on on the second place and past forms on the third place yeah and we can see all uh, as well that uh, well gerunds are less or uh, indicative future are less used forms yeah, so this is what, what we have. Well, um, and now I will do some just pre-processing. You can just run this code uh, because actually we just apply uh, the functions in order to uh, encode my data. So just don't bother to, well, just to just to run it and forget about this and i will just show you the result of this function one more preprocessing pre is to actually to uh just uh treat two verbs such as is and abishat as biospectral so in any use we are not sure whether these verbs are imperfective or perfective so we just code the, uh, these forms as b which is biospectral and then um uh, eventually i get only those limas 
which occur in my uh, data set more than uh, 50 times. So I can show you what happens here. No, sorry. So can you uh, can you see the uh, matrix for TT variable? Yeah. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. So this is just very uh, simple thing how we, well, just think about our verbs as profiles of some forms. So now let me go back to And now I just uh, shortly uh, wanted to show you how the TSNE visualization works. And here it is not about correspondence analysis, but just another way to plot the data using these numbers just as numerals. Yeah, so it is not about categorical variables. It's not just I use uh, my matrix just as numbers. Yeah, uh, I use RTSNE library for this. So actually there are two popular libraries for TSNE visualization. Uh, the first one is RTSNE and another one is just TSNE. Yeah, and here I just uh, put uh, some parameters such as perplexity and uh, maximum number of uh, iterations. Well, and after you r run this code, you will hopefully get something like this. Well, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, uh, could you remind me uh, what is TSNE kind of uh, visualization? I think, uh, I believe that you already know about this technique. Is it something that we had uh, at the election before, like the triangle? Oh, no, uh, actually, I think that it is usually, uh, uh, well, uh, you usually uh, talk about these in your computational linguistic classes. And if not, I can just shortly, briefly do, uh, just explain this. Mm 
Well, it looks like classes or something like that. Plot for classes. Ah, okay. So uh, in this case, I just give you just an idea what to do. First of all, uh, TSNI is usually used for when you plot uh, uh, distributional semantic uh, um, uh, vector models. Uh, for example, in uh, in uh, well, um, in things like uh, Rus vectores or GLOV or word to vec and other models. And the idea is that well, if we have too many um, points in our data set, then it is not that easy to, well, make clear clustering. And the task to do, uh, well, to calculate distances and to, well, plot these thousands of points be, be, uh, become very computational heavy. Yeah? Uh, well, um, just one, uh, just another uh, example. Um, for example, we can have uh, uh, geographic coordinates, longitudes and latitudes for say for um, uh, places in the United States. Yeah, uh, I think that it is, um, well, not that, um, um, it's just easy to, if we have, say, five cities, it's very easy to plot them on some space. If we, uh, actually, if we don't know anything about their coordinates themselves, but know the distance between each city and all other cities. I think that you know, well, something about uh, distance maps in terms distance maps for cities, distance maps for, say, some polar stations or distance maps for, I don't know what, um, Starbucks uh, cafeteria and things like that. Yeah, so if we know the distance between one particular city and all other cities, we can actually calculate something like just PCA and plot the map. But uh, if we have this kind of distance for, say, 3,000 uh, 3, uh, cities in the United States, uh, what happens then? Hmm. What do you think? Why it is not that trivial to map all 3,000 cities? Any suggestions, guys? Yeah. Be uh, Ira says that uh, it is because points become indistinguishable. Uh, no, I don't uh, think, uh, I don't mean this, uh, but I mean that uh, actually, um, uh, the distances between cities or towns, they actually, well, calculated, taking into account some curvy roads or some um, mountains, some hills. Uh, so actually, um, even if uh, three cities lies, uh, lie on the same uh, line, yeah, then uh, the sum of two distances won't be equal to the third one. Is this clear? More or less. So if we use this kind of distance map to plot our uh, cities on the map, we actually have to just um, 
to to have some information loss so in some cases we have to just well do some mm, to ignore some distances yeah or to just um, to plot them in just most probable like way yeah but actually the real the real uh, coordinates won't exactly um, uh, be just as they are on the Google Maps or on, on, the, uh, on the Google Maps plots, right? Okay. So what people uh, do in this case? Uh, actually, we first we have to just um, choose some landmarks. So first, actually, we have to choose some subset of our cities, yeah? And then after, after that, uh, we just plot our um, uh, space, just uh, taking into account the distances between, say, just 10 cities, 10 major cities of the United States. And after we constructed this space, we try to plot other coordinates just using this, uh, the distances uh, to these particular landmarks. I hope this well, will help you to understand the idea. Yeah. And that is exactly what TSNE algorithm does. If we have too many points in our data set. Uh, it also starts to, uh, well, um, uh, reveal some uh, important points or landmarks, yeah, uh, which can be uh, considered as centers for some cluster of data points, yeah. So the space is constructed in uh, such a way that actually uh, the distance between different clusters is distinguishable. Yeah. Uh, and after that, all other points in this space uh, is plotted as a supplementary point. But one more important thing that TSNE algorithm do uh, does. If we have some um, cluster, uh, in this particular cluster, just taking into account the data for a set, a subset of particular points, uh, it calibrates the coordinates in such a way that uh, within this cluster, the distances between points would be more kind of uh, interpretable. Yeah, so if we have a cluster of five points and we see that there are a subgroup of three points and, ten po uh, and two points, then actually the distance between one subcluster and another, another subcluster will also be clearly distinguishable. That is generally what I wanted to tell you about TSNE algorithm. Yeah, so for now you can just uh, Remember that this is very useful way to um, plot your data, especially if you uh, deal with uh, distributional semantic uh, models such as uh, GLOVE or Rules Vectors. Okay, so uh, let me go back to this uh, slide with TSNE visualization. And my second um, question to you is, uh, could you see some picture here? How you would interpret this data? Just remind that I is imperfective verb, uh, P is for perfective verb, 
несовершенный вид and совершенный вид. Yeah? And B is for bispectral verbs. Yes, we have one message. Yeah, uh, Ira says that we have two major clusters. I agree with you. Uh, one for I verbs and another one for P uh, verbs. And what about the bispectral verbs? There are two points here and here. Yeah, there are too few of them. Yeah, but, uh, well, since they're bispectral, so they combine some properties of perfective verbs and imperfective verbs, I think it is quite understandable that they are in between with these two clusters. Yeah, that's just what I wanted to see in my uh, visualization. Yeah. Okay, and now let me uh, go to the correspondence analysis. Uh, can I have a question? Oh, yeah, I yeah. have a little different picture from yours. Is it okay? Yeah, uh, because no. actually, uh, uh, when I started to do TSNI vis uh, visualization, Mm -hmm. I didn't fix uh, my uh, random number. Oh, okay. If okay. I would set seed mm -hmm. for, say, 42, and you do the same, uh, then we would get exactly the same picture. But here okay, you, you, you see that mm -hmm. there are a lot of random processing here, uh, random computation, yeah? So it's just natural that you get another picture. Is it that different from, from mine? Uh, mine looks like uh, normalization, but uh, it's have two clusters and uh, B uh, between them uh, two. So I think that it is uh, quite similar. Yeah, but, right. But a bit different. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but uh, actually, uh, yeah, as we'll see, uh, actually, uh, some of my, well, pictures here, actually, the uh, upper cluster could be, uh, well, actually, located in different uh, corner, or even I could flip them horizontally, or, so actually, it's not about how this looks like exactly, but about, well, general uh, pattern, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, do you have any other question about this part of class? So, in the previous plot, we just saw the uh, the idea about how uh, our well um, I and P verbs are just plotted on the picture. But now let us go uh, to the correspondence analysis uh, thing. And first, uh, let's take uh, the uh, columns from one to nine, from here, and uh, apply correspondence analysis to this thing. Yeah, again, uh, there is a huge number of um, functions to do correspondence analysis in R, and we will use uh, CA function today. Well, uh, this uh, uh, object, TTCA, uh, actually has uh, two useful uh, parameters. The first one is call cord which is coordinates for columns. And the second one is row chord, 
which is um, uh, coordinates for rows. And then we just um, do a data frame, yeah, and assign uh, row names uh, uh, of our initial table to our TT call and TT row uh, new objects. You can also run the summary of TTCA to see what other information we get from this correspondence analysis. And if you are done with the just correspondence analysis, let us plot the data. And on the uh, X and Y axis, I will also plot uh, information on uh, explained variance. Actually, uh, explained variance is interpreted just the same way as in principal component analysis, but usually it is less than in PCA. So, it is considered okay if the uh, explained variance on the first and second dimension is about 50%. Because remember, uh, we have uh, many, uh, in this case, we have a lot of uh, levels in our factor for grammatical category. Yeah, and you see what happens here. So in this plot, we see that, well, explained variance is, well, about 49. Well, about 60%, yeah. Um, and uh, now we can just interpret what happens in this plot. Uh, this is a biplot where we see both um, grammatical categories and the distribution of our verbs. So first, we usually start with interpretation of uh, grammatical categories or some other variables, yeah, which are important in our uh, uh, in, in our uh, data set, yeah, and we can think about well uh, some interesting phenomena. Okay, uh, first of all, let us look at the um, uh, o, o point here. Yeah. Uh, first of all, it's nice that none of the grammatical categories is about this point. Yeah. So all categories are somehow uh, don't have any average distribution of uh, verbs in them. Yeah. So it's not, not nice to see that actually we have two subplanes and we see, well, the right subplane, yeah, with gerunds and participle past and imperative and past forms here. And well, Actually, for those of you who are native speakers of Russian, I can ask what kind of verbs are there.
Ну, это совершенный вид, видимо. Да. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and on the left subplane we see forms such as uh, future uh, and uh, gerund uh, non-past, which is gerund present, and indicative non-past, which is indicative present. Forms like uh, chitayu and uh, siju and so on. So actually here we expect to see uh, imperfective verbs. Yeah. Well, and we see that there is one more category, which is present participle, yeah, which is a kind of, well, far from two clusters, I would say, yeah, this cluster and that cluster. So I would think of this category as kind of non trivial and would look into that thing just using my correspondence analysis plot as a way for exploratory analysis for further further analysis yeah that is what people usually usually do here uh, yet another thing is uh, how uh, do if is whether we have some categories which are kind of uh, very close to each other. In this, uh, well, respect, I would look into these two forms, which is imperative and infinitive. Yeah. So here it would be nice to, well, conclude that uh, infinitive and imperative forms behave mostly the same way and well uh, for this particular task of plotting verbs according to their grammatical profiles the these two features are not identical but very close to each other And of course, we could um, look at the points and could talk about um, individual verbs. And of course, uh, we could see that there are some verbs that are, well, ca uh, have a kind of average profile. But at the same time, we have some uh, more, much more verbs that uh, are distributed much more uh, further to the left or further to the right. And there are even some interesting points there. So I would also plot the names for the verbs and could look uh, at, the, uh, at their behavior just in, in my um, uh, corpus data. But I think it is just, we can just stop uh, now with this uh, case study. And if uh, nobody have other questions, we could go to the multiple correspondence analysis technique. Any questions so far? No questions, great. Okay, so now uh, we will uh, take uh, the data set you are already know. This is the data set about um, Dutch uh, periphrastic causative constructions. I remember that we discussed it uh, two classes before. Yeah, but just to uh, remind you, uh, I have to say that uh, the authors took uh, a 10, 8 million uh, corpus of uh, Dutch with two 
regional uh, varieties of Dutch, Netherlandic, and Belgian. Uh, and they, uh, well, took, uh, collected a sample of uh, construction of uh, the of the uses of uh, these constructions, and coded them for seven semantic, syntactic, uh, thematic variables, and also geographical uh, term. And now we will take uh, just some of them. Uh, namely, uh, country uh, causation with levels affective, in, inducive, physical, and volitional. Uh, app trans. F, the, this is uh, which uh, shows us the transitivity of uh, affected predicate, which can be uh, either intransitive or transitive. And IP trans one, uh, which is just a simplification of, of the previous one. And now we will use uh, the uh, function MC uh, since we have more than two categorical variables. Yeah. So. First of all, let us look at the uh, data set itself. So let me show you. Sorry, my laptop has to resume the R session, but hopefully we'll, we'll see the data. Yeah. So here what we have, uh, uh, in the beginning we have, uh, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine um, uh, variables. Yeah. And uh, each line, uh, represent one use of one verb. And we see that there is a construction with doing, with certain properties, and in the, for example, in the second line, we, we have a construction with Latin, with some other properties. And now let me go back to the code. No, it's not this, sorry. Oh, I see what, what happened. Uh, yeah, I have to just... Uh, Sorry.
yeah so now i have resume sharing i can resume sharing my screen yeah yeah so yeah i um well i'm back with my dutch causative constructions data uh can you see uh, the screen uh share share to you yes okay great um okay so i just downloaded my um uh, my data set and applied the multiple correspondence analysis um uh using all uh, columns except the first one and oh sorry one question let me look at this uh, sorry but what but sorry irina uh okay sorry just look at what happens here The problem is that I see another screen. Uh... We see github.com, right? Oh, no. Oh, I see, I see. And now, can you see uh, something useful now? Yes. Oh, great. OK, uh, so I just uh, show you that I read my data. Yeah, and applied the multiple correspondence analysis function. Yeah, and in this case, the first uh, thing I'm interested in is the amount of explained variance. Yeah, so I will look into the MCA. Yeah, and we see that uh there is some amount of explained uh, variance yeah okay and now i can just add uh the result of my multiple correspondence analysis to the previous uh, data set so actually for each uh, data point uh, in my data set i assign the mca rs parameter which are interpreted as uh, row uh, scores And I will also assign uh, CS, which are column scores, to the um, uh, to the uh, variable which I call variables. Yeah, and then I uh, just use it to name uh, uh, the to use row names of MCA uh, ACS as uh, variable names in my new uh, object variables. Okay, and now I can just plot what I get here. So you can see that, well, we use uh, the two uh, first uh, parameters as X and Y coordinates. And we also color uh, our data points according to their uh, constructions. So uh, doing uh, is colored with red or magenta, I don't know, and uh, Latin is colored as green or cyan or something like that. And now I print the 
uh, names for my variables uh, according to the coordinates uh, which were passed with CS uh, parameter of MCA. So what you see here, that's my question now. Я думаю, что можно отвечать по-русски. Ну, здесь две группы, которые пересекаются между собой. Да, значит, мы в этом случае... Uh, oh, okay, in English. So, in this case, we can interpret our uh, visualization as two clusters that overlap. And actually, we know that there are two clusters seen, since we have uh, explicitly coded uh, doing constructions with red and Latin constructions with green, right? Uh, we can interpret this in such a way that actually the profiles, in this case, the constructional profiles of uh, our verbs are a kind of overlap. Yeah, so there are many, uh, well, properties that are shared between two clusters. Okay, the second uh, thing is that we can look at the uh, center of our space, uh, the uh, point O, O, yeah, and see that there are many uh, uses that are a kind of, well, have average distribution of uh, uh, various variables, yeah. So actually these uh, uses are not that interested for us because we are usually interested in uh, more uh, non-trivial distributions. Yeah. Uh, but the most interesting thing here is to see uh, where the, uh, our variables are located yeah so here we see uh, some variables such as constructional semantics in animate yeah and some like like uh, uh, model semantics mental and other things yeah and we are usually interested in those uh, features that uh, which are, are also well located in some part of the space. Yeah. Uh, again, uh, there are two main uh, techniques how to interpret this uh, plot. The first one, we can look at the upper part, upper plane of uh, our, um, no, no, sorry. Uh, first we look uh, at the right and level subplanes, yeah? Because this is the first dimension and that is where the explained variance is larger than uh, uh, according to the second dimension, yeah? So here we just trying to figure out uh, which uh, um, variables are distributed in two different subplanes. And then we do the same thing with uh, upper and bottom subplanes, uh, also trying to figure out uh, how these features are uh, can be um, compared to each other. And uh, in the context of linguistic data, it is usually that if we have two uh, 
say, uh, grammatical features in one grammatical category, it's quite natural that usually one feature is, could be in one subplane and another one in another subplane. But uh, this is just the general rule and there are a lot of exceptions as well. So the first technique is about looking at uh, different subplanes and trying to interpret these uh, these uh, variables. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is to look at the angles uh, between two particular variables. So now let us look at uh, the two uh, variables, which are domain E. I think this is a kind of, well, um, about uh, some genre of the text. Uh, I don't remember exactly what E exactly is, probably electronic communication or something like that. Is because as far as I remember, F is for fiction. Uh, and we also see that there is another feature, uh, the syntax of uh, noun phrase, of uh, the uh, affected verb. And we see that these two, uh, if we uh, draw the line to the first feature and the second feature, the angle between these lines uh, is just very small. Yeah, so we can conclude that these two features are um, behave the same way or approximately the same way yeah and the say uh, can be said about these two features yeah and say um, things like this one you can see that even though they are located not extremely close to each other and c synth dot impl is much further to the right than say the apt trans yeah but still the angle between these two uh, points is very small uh, any question at this point Okay, no question. Uh, then I have one more question about, say, these two green or cyan points in the bottom of my uh, plot. Can you see uh, them? These two, uh, these two uh, points. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So how could you interpret uh, the behavior of these two uses of the verbs? In terms of uh, grammatical features, we got it. Any guesses?
So can I interpret them in such a way that they are far from any grammatical feature? And so they're kind of uninterpretable. But they are close enough to features like domain F and something like that. They are more close uh, for these features than, for example, to CRSM in Nunum and something like that. Yeah. So actually, we are usually uh, talking about uh, contribution of certain features to the uh, position of this point. Yeah. So we could say that say features like this one, I can't actually read them, something about semantic trans inter, sorry, I, I just don't see exactly what, what's there. So actually this um, parameter contributed yeah, to the uh, location of these two data points uh, in this part of the plot. Yeah, and domain F, also contributed to the distribution of, uh, of such a pattern of distribution. Yeah. Uh, but can we say that they are not associated with, say, features like uh, SEM meant in the upper part of the plot? Yes, we can, or we can say that they are associated less than the others. Yeah, uh, usually people say that they are negatively associated, yeah, positively or negatively. But actually, uh, that is the point where you have to stop doing just visualization and just um, free interpretation of your data and start to look at the numbers as they are in your data set or in say in in contingency tables and especially with row numbers so the first principle to interpret your data just to check the row numbers every time when you do things uh, it could be that for example uh, the most uses of uh, these two verbs would have a lot of uh, these uh, features attested. But still, as other features would be presented um, uh, in some, um, in even more, uh, then it can be that this feature will be uh, placed just on the opposite subplane of your space. Uh, and that is why uh, on the um, our course page, I put uh, just uh, one useful um, text uh, about how to how to interpret uh, correspondence analysis. Uh, there are, as far as I remember, about 10 uh, advices uh, about frequent um, errors in uh, correspondence analysis interpretation. Yeah, but uh, all of them can be reduced to just one. Always check the row numbers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in uh, the next um, homework, you see uh, such an example and we will ask you to interpret the data and see some discrepancies between how the data are plotted and how they are presented in row numbers. So please be careful. And I think this is all for today. Uh, we will meet uh, in two weeks now. And as we have a long break, uh, please remember that we expect your, the first part of your projects uh, in some time in the, in the future. And if, we ha if you have any question with regard to your uh, projects, 
so please just ask me or Ilya and we'll be happy to ask them. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Excuse me, I have a question. Yeah. Um, when can we expect, um, if uh, we can expect it at all, uh, our uh, previous uh, homeworks graded and, uh, you know, to see uh, which mistakes we made and so on? Uh, nice question. I will check it and I will write you. Yeah, great. Okay. So thank you all. Bye. Bye.